If you've ever had the feeling that someone is eavesdropping on your calls, reading your messages and emails, and even knows where you've been going, you just might be right. Abusers often utilize stalkerware to control and manipulate their targets. Being educated on what it is, how it got there, and how to clean it off your devices, and where to go for help can make a world of difference. Today's guest is Eva Galperin. Eva is the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. She has worked in security and IT in Silicon Valley and earned degrees in political science and international relations. She has applied the combination of her poli-sci and technical backgrounds to everything, including organizing EFF's Tor Relay Challenge to writing privacy and security training manuals, including surveillance self-defense and the digital first aid kit. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Eva, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. It's my pleasure. Can you give me a little background? Uh, first of all, how you came to be at the uh, EFF, the Electronic Front. Electronic Frontier Foundation, not Freedom Foundation, uh, and then how you got involved in addressing stalkerware. Well, uh, I was I ended up at the Electronic Frontier Foundation because I was sort of kidnapped on my way to law school. Um, I had been working in tech. Uh, tech suffered one of its periodic explosions when there were no jobs. I went back to school and said that uh, that I was going to go become a lawyer. And uh, sort of in the year between finishing school and starting law school, I took this job at, uh, at the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation, and uh, they just wouldn't let me leave. They just they shut the door. And uh, so I did I did legal intake. I worked on the activism team. I've worked on the international team. I'm currently working on the tech team. I uh, head up uh, our, our threat lab. So uh, I, I have seen nearly every part of the organization at this point. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can imagine you've been there uh, more than a day. And, and so how did, you know, was Stockware something that you ran across there or did you run across it somewhere else as sort of a concept? Well, I was already familiar with Stockware because I had been uh, I had been working in, in tech since I was a teenager. Um, but uh, specifically the reason why I, uh, I started the Coalition Against Stockware and started doing my Stockware research was uh, that the the person with whom I was doing research on uh, on nation state spying in order to protect journalists and activists from being spied on by governments uh, turned out to be a serial rapist. Oh, gee. And his survivors were really, really scared that he was going to install uh, spyware on their computers and on their phones. And that was one of the reasons why a lot of them took so long to come forward. And I was so angry about this that I essentially uh, started a project <laughs> in which I was helping out uh, people who were concerned about their devices being spied on. Uh, and then that sort of branched out into research about, you know, sort of what stalkerware is and how, uh, how prevalent it is. Uh, and that became the coalition against stalkerware, which uh, which sort of works to eradicate stalkerware from the landscape entirely. And, and you know, I I have listened to a, a few of your presentations. And my, the first thing that went through my mind initially was, well, shouldn't like antivirus and malware catch stalkerware? Well, uh, that was also my thought back in 2018. Uh, I thought, you know, hey, isn't there an entire class of um, of apps that are designed specifically to see whether or not there's something you don't want on your phone or on your computer? And so I tested them out to see how good they were at finding the, you know, the latest stalkerware for uh, for both phones and desktops. And I discovered they weren't very good at all. Uh, the the results that I got were abysmal. And there were a bunch of different reasons for this, and the different companies had all kinds of different justifications for why they thought that they might classify stalkerware as being, you know, kind of, sort of legitimate use, because you could use it to, you know, track your children or your employees, or maybe it's actually okay to try to, you know, track your partner because that bitch is cheating on you. Uh, so there were, uh, there was a some pushback in this area. Uh, and so I, um, I essentially started with one company and uh, pushed them to start um, keeping track of the entire stalkerware market 
um, and doing a much better job of not just identifying stalkerware, but to send up a specific message that you get when you run their AV product that tells you there is stalkerware on your device and gives you the opportunity to remove it if you want. Um, now, it's not going to remove it automatically, and the reason for that is that uh, the the survivor uh, has the um, the survivor should really be left with uh, with the choice. Uh, the survivor has a very good idea of you know usually who their abuser is uh, and how they're likely to react if they remove the stalkerware. Uh, and some abusers, if uh, if they are faced with this kind of action, uh, might uh, might escalate their abuse, including escalating to violence. Uh, and so I really want to uh, leave the power in the hands of the users whenever I can. So I know that you had you had started that a number of years ago, and the the results were particularly poor. Has it gotten better? Yes, yes, it has. Uh, that's actually one of the one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, that there's a company called AV Comparatives, and uh, they have put out their research on uh, uh, year by year on the sort of stalkerware market and uh, how detection is going among the various AV companies, and it's definitely gone up. Uh, over the last three years and, and pretty consistently. Uh, companies like Kaspersky and Malwarebytes also uh, put out reports specifically about stalkerware in which they talk about how much stalkerware they're detecting and the amount of stalkerware that they're detecting is also going up. Um, now, this could be for a number of reasons. One, this could be because use of stalkerware is going up. Um, so that would be bad. Um, but it could also just be that we're better at finding it. And when we're better at finding it, we can get better at removing it and we can have uh, more people who are aware that they are being spied on and can do something about it. That's that's good. Is it I, I know I think from your previous presentations I saw, you know, back in 2018, 2019, it was maybe five, 10 percent of, mal, of malware, uh, sorry, malware, uh, stalkerware was being caught by antivirus products. What kind of percentage is it, is it now? Well, uh, it really depends on the AV product. Uh, but the most recent report from um, from AV Comparatives uh, it indicates that I think like the the lowest rate of detection among the AV products that they tested was something like sixty percent, and the highest was something like ninety five percent. Oh, that's awesome! That's yeah. that's amazing so that it's gone up so much and that they're we've done a lot taking it seriously. <laughs> That, that's absolutely amazing. So how so in most of those cases, how is the stalkerware getting on the getting on the device? Is it like a remote hacking or physical access? It's almost always physical access. Um, I mean, remote hacking is uh, is exciting and fancy. Um, but in the case in sort of domestic abuse cases, it's extremely common for the abuser to have physical access to uh, to the survivor's phone. Uh, and furthermore, they would not just have physical access. They often also have uh, have the password. They often have, you know, the Apple ID if it's an iPhone. Uh, they can unlock it themselves and install whatever the hell they want. And there's no reason to remotely hack a phone when you can just pick it up and install the spyware while you're, you know, uh, you know, while your victim is in the other room. It takes less than a minute. Yeah, and that's you know, if someone has the the unlock code for the pa for the phone it's pretty much administrative at root access to the device in effect it's certainly sufficient access to install stalkerware i uh, and and that's very troubling uh, one of the big problems that i had uh, convincing av companies that this kind of uh, software was malicious uh, was they would tell me well the only way to install it on somebody's um, on somebody's device is to have physical access to the device. And if a person has physical access to the device and the username and the password, that's legitimate access to the device. And I had to tell them, I have news for you about how abuse works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I think in, in like a corporate environment that, that thought makes sense of like, well, of course, only people who have the username and password have physical access to the device. Why would anyone else have that? Um, uh, but, you know, my wife, she has my password. I have her password. You know, we, we can unlock each other's phones. Um, thankfully, I, I'm not stalking her. Hopefully, she's not stalking me. Um, but, it, like, it seems to me that, that 
that use case or that that situation is 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 extremely common is that you know significant others almost always or maybe it's not always i don't know but significant others very frequently would have access to passwords and and, and passcodes and whatnot it's very common in modern relationships and uh, it is nearly 100% common in abusive relationships yeah, and i assume it it goes down the lines of well if you really loved me and you really you know, if you really yeah. trusted me, mm-hmm. of course you would give me your password. And now it becomes the the survivors. Uh, it puts them in a negative light for, for not providing that information. Yes. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of the sort of uh, power dynamics of abuse is that frequently the abuser has full access to their uh, to the survivor's phone, but not vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I want full access to your phone, but you can't have full access to my phone. No, no, you can't know where I am or what I'm doing. <laughs> that right there should be a red flag. So uh, we, we talked about uh, device compromise. How, other than running uh, a, a good antivirus, which has a good reputation for catching uh, stalkerware, are there ways that people can, can find the stalkerware on their device or signs that might give an indication that, that something is installed on their device? Well, uh, when it comes to stalkerware for Android stalkerware, I strongly recommend just installing uh, an antivirus program and running it on its highest settings. And the chances that it will uh, detect your your stalkerware are fairly high. Um, stalkerware on on iPhones works rather differently, and that's because of the way that the the iPhone uh, restricts certain powers. Uh, from people who are uh, from people who are running apps, uh, Apple really reserves a lot of power for themselves. You can't get root on your uh, on your iPhone without uh, without jailbreaking it. And so, if your if your iPhone is not jailbroken, uh, then um, the easiest way for people to see what is happening on your phone and to spy on you is uh, to use software that will simply scrape your iCloud backup. Mm. So uh, you don't even need physical access to the phone. All you need is somebody's Apple ID and password, and then you turn on iCloud backups, and then uh, there there is software that will uh, essentially download a full copy of that backup once a day. Uh, that doesn't give you real-time access to, to what somebody is doing, but a full snapshot of somebody's phone once a day is still very revealing. Yeah, and I'm sure it gives a, a fair amount of history of activity and that's enough to, uh, to 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 put someone in an uncomfortable position it is certainly not information i would want my abuser to have yeah and, and is it the same sort of thing with uh de- gosh i think people have less less frequently have desktops these days or laptops but do you, is it the same sort of comparison between windows and mac os no uh so uh both windows and mac os uh essentially um host the same vague types of stalkerware, uh, often installed directly on the machine. And uh, that's the sort of thing that you can usually address with uh, with a good AV product. Gotcha. And, they're, and so it's the same thing, whether it's Mac or PC, uh, Windows or Mac, it's fairly easy to install something surreptitiously and have it yes. running in the background that the person doesn't see. Absolutely. Especially since... Um, our laptops and our desktop machines are often sitting there in our homes, uh, waiting to be accessed by anybody who is there. People frequently uh, share desktop machines, and so it's not uncommon for everybody in the household to have uh, the, you know, to share the same login and to install whatever they want. Yep. And, and I know, like, I'm often approached by people who who think their devices have been compromised, and obviously, if I'm Responding to a support ticket online, there's no way for me to know, you know, you know sitting halfway across the country or halfway around the world, whether their, their device has actually been compromised or not. Um, but it, but once they start telling me like what they what they see happening, it looks often like it's more like some like their Facebook account has been compromised, or maybe it's, someone's gotten into their Gmail account, which of course you know they use their Gmail account password for everything, and you know everything is laid bare. So for, for people, how do, would they normally tell the difference between like a device compromise and an account compromise? Well, frequently when people come to me and they're concerned about account compromise, uh, they don't really understand what an indicator of compromise for account compromise versus uh, versus device compromise is. 
Um, because for most people, it's not entirely clear uh, what's an account and what's a device and what data lives where. Um, but most of the time when people come to me with a problem, it's almost always account compromise. And uh, I have had people come to me with, you know, compromised Apple IDs, with compromised Facebook accounts, with Instagram accounts, Twitter accounts, TikTok accounts. I've been doing this for long enough that I had to learn what TikTok was. <laughs> um, basically, if it had a login, I have seen it compromised. Uh, and compromising somebody's login is relatively easy. Uh, whereas installing stalkerware is harder than that, which is why uh, account compromise is so incredibly common. Um, and what I tell people when they have account compromise uh, is that this, the solution is quite simple. It is very easy when somebody has stolen your keys to change your locks. So what you do when you have uh, when you have account compromise is you change your password. You change your password to something which is unique that you're not using for any other account which is uh, long so that other people cannot guess it. Uh, and you might want to use a program called a password manager to, uh, to manage all of these passwords because trying to remember a hundred long unique logins off of the top your, of your head is impossible. Um, and in fact, if you can do this, then probably there is a problem with your passwords. <laughs> um, so once you have your unique, strong new password that is difficult to guess, uh, the next thing that you need to do is you need to turn on uh, two-factor authentication. And there are a number of different types of two-factor authentication that you can turn on, but essentially two-factor authentication is uh, any login where it is not enough to have somebody's password, you must also have a code which is sent to you on another device. And uh, sometimes that is sent to you via SMS. Sometimes that code is sent to you in an app like uh, Google Authenticator or Authy. Uh, and sometimes that, uh, that code is sent to a special key, uh, which you can physically possess. And so there's absolutely no question you either have it or you don't have it. Um, and the, the least secure version of 2FA is SMS. Uh, the most secure is uh, the, the actual physical key. Um, but generally, what I recommend for people in terms of usability is something in the middle uh, to go ahead and use some form of authenticator app like uh, Google Authenticator or Authy and have uh, your, your 2FA send the code to that, uh, to that app. And I suppose it really depends on the uh, technological uh, prowess of the person who's using it, I would uh, probably never give my mom a YubiKey and have her use that. It's I've got one more key thing I got to put on my keychain. I've got one more thing I've got to keep track of, or actually, probably it's probably the, uh, hard to meet people where they are. Yeah, uh, and to not tell them that they don't deserve security because they cannot play security on the hardest set. Um, I want to give people advice that they will actually use, because if I give people complicated and confusing advice, then they simply tune out. And then I haven't done anything but make myself feel good for having given advice and then just, you know, put a cape on and flown away like a superhero. That doesn't actually do anything. No, it doesn't. Uh, everyone likes it when Superman's there, but as soon as he uh, flies off somewhere, he's not really helping you anymore. <laughs> and, and I know, like... A lot of the people that I end up talking to are looking in their uh, the account settings for their their Facebook account, and they're saying, "Hey, I I see all these IP addresses, or I see these other devices that have logged into my account. How reliable is that information? How useful is that information?" Well, it depends. This is the least satisfying thing about uh, security advice is that it always starts with an engineer looking off into the distance and going, "Well." It depends. Um, but I do recommend if you think that uh, that somebody has compromised uh, your uh, your device or somebody has compromised your account, that you should go into your uh, into your account settings and you should look for the page that tells you about uh, the devices that have logged into your account and the IP addresses and uh, often something about the you know browser being used. Uh, to log into the account. And if you see things that are unfamiliar and that do not make sense to you, then um, often the smartest thing to do, again, is uh, change your locks and turn on 2FA. 
if you have changed your locks and turned on 2FA and you still see this sort of thing, then there's a very good chance that you are looking at uh, at device compromise. And that's when you start, uh, you, you break out the, the antivirus. Gotcha. So it's like if, if you only have an iPhone and you see that there's an Android phone logged into your Facebook account somewhere, different mm-hmm. state, that's different country. Specific. Yeah. That's a good indicator that someone else has gotten your password. Absolutely. And I, I know uh, a number of platforms have a way to like forcibly log out other devices uh, from that, but that's only really useful uh, in conjunction with changing your password, I assume. Because if you force them to log out and they have your password, they can still get back in. <laughs> yes, always do both. So it's, a, so it's definitely a combination of doing both. Yes. First, kick the attacker out of the house, then change your locks. Then, then change the locks. And I know there's – so then there's this new uh, – I guess technically it's really not new. There's kind of this uh, not your phone compromise, not an account compromise, but you're now starting to see uh, kind of personal tracking devices. I want to make sure that if I lose my backpack, I can find it or if my luggage disappears at the airport, I, I can find it. And you know, my mind immediately went to – Oh well, I could just slip this in someone else's backpack, or or drop it in someone else's car, and I now know where they are. You know, possibly in real time, all day long, every day. Yes, these personal trackers that are uh, meant for people to uh, keep track of uh, of lost items um, are essentially a gift to stalkers, uh, and that's because the personal trackers, such as the tile and the air tag, are uh, they're very small. They're uh, very easy to hide, and uh, often they either have very weak mitigations against their use for stalking. Um, Apple's mitigations, for example, uh, really only work if you are an iPhone user, and their uh, their version of an alert if you are not uh, an iPhone user is essentially a beep that happens after three days, no and gee. that beep is very quiet. <laughs> So it's extremely easy to get around. Uh, and Tile basically just doesn't have any mitigations at all. Uh, so these things are, uh, we're, we're definitely starting to see them being used as a tool of abuse. And one of the reasons for that is uh, because the, uh, the organizations that work with survivors of abuse um, are extremely familiar with, um, with abuse on phones with abuse on devices. And so one of the things that they do uh, when you go into a you know domestic abuse shelter is they take all of your devices and they assume from the very beginning that they are compromised. Um, but if an abuser wants to keep track of, uh, of their victim uh, and they understand that they are going to be handing over their phone, then, uh, then these kinds of personal trackers suddenly become uh, really useful. And I get a lot of pushback from people who say, well, you know, what am I supposed to do in order to keep track of my wallet or my keys or my bicycle um, if some jerk steals it? And I tell them that I actually care more about violence to uh, victims of intimate partner abuse. And I care more about stalking than I do about your bike. And it is impossible to build a tool that will track a thief that will not also be excellent for tracking an abuser because they're both predicated on the notion that uh, that you should be able to track somebody's location when they're holding an item and they should not know about it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it really ties around the uh, permission. Yes. <laughs> and whether it's permission to install an app or permission to stick something in someone's backpack without them knowing or a parent installing something on their kid's phone without them knowing – it's really Absolutely. about permission and communication. I, I get a lot of people asking me, well, you know, isn't it okay for me to do this to my kids? Uh, shouldn't I be able to track where my kids are located and see all of their text messages and listen to their calls? And I tell them, like, listen, this is, I'm not going to tell you how to raise your kids for the most part. Uh, I have a few opinions, uh, but for the, for the most part, I'm not going to tell you how to raise your kids. Um, but what I will tell you is that uh, software that allows you to do this without notifying the user, uh, that deliberately circumvents consent, that hides from the person who is using it so that they don't know that they are being watched, is in and of itself abusive. Installing this stuff is abuse. 
if you want to watch your kids, if you want to watch your employees, even if you want to watch your spouse, there is equivalent software that doesn't hide, that tells you when it's working, that tells you exactly what it does. And if you are uh, sharing this information with your spouse or your child or, or whoever, um, then they should know about it. They should be fully aware of what you can and cannot see and what you do and do not know, uh, because it's, it's the part where you don't have their consent and where you're tricking them that, uh, that makes it abusive. Yeah, I, I I get those emails from people saying, "Hey, I I think my spouse is is cheating on me. Um, I want to get into their device." And I'm like, "If you think they're cheating on you, go, go talk to a divorce lawyer. Don't <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, tracking them is probably without their permission is probably illegal in almost every jurisdiction around the world. And if you don't trust them enough, you know, and you feel you need to install something on their phone without their permission, you've, you've got bigger problems. Like, that's not your problem. Yeah. <laughs> Whether yeah. or not you can get something onto their phone without them noting is not the issue. You've no. got issues um, outside of that. And it's really terrible to see people, uh, sometimes even people who have been abused, uh, feel like the only way that they can take back power is to become abusers themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's simply not true. If you feel that you have to spy on someone, if you feel like you have to do this to somebody, your relationship is already done. And what you should do is walk away. Yeah, that's that's, that's very much the case. And I was, I was kind of looking through some of my notes here. You had talked about like doing forensic analysis on, on people's phones and to see what's on there. And people are, you know, have asked me, hey, can can you look at my phone and tell me like how much work does it take to actually be able to determine whether there's, there's something surreptitiously installed on a phone? A lot. That was one of the reasons why I went to the AV companies because um, personally taking a look at everybody's phone um, by myself is not a scalable solution. Yeah. It takes a, it takes a really long time. Uh, it takes specialized equipment It takes specialized knowledge. And even then you won't necessarily find the thing. Uh, This is this is not a good way of of going about it. It's where I started. But it's uh, the whole reason I started the coalition against stalkerware was uh, because I don't scale. Yeah. So so is uh, resetting a device to factory settings enough to get around a device compromise? It depends. Uh, for, uh, for an iPhone, for most forms of compromise, resetting, uh, resetting the device to factory settings is sufficient. And in fact, for most forms of compromise, even just rebooting the phone is sufficient, um, depending on you know, what sort of um, things this particular piece of software is, uh, is taking advantage of. But you also really need to change your Apple ID password and possibly, you know, also take a look at your iCloud, maybe disable your iCloud backups. Um, so there are, there are a lot of things that you need to do. Uh, for an Android, it is less likely. There are uh, still ways of, uh, of getting around permissions on Android. And one of the reasons for that is because uh, the Android ecosystem uh, does not lock uh, the people who build apps um, out of uh, out of root access quite as diligently as Apple does. And the whole uh, advantage of that, like as a hacker, I love that because you have the freedom to make the device do whatever you want. Um, as a security person, I hate that because you have the freedom to make the device do whatever you want. <laughs> it, it, it's that uh, uh, open source versus walled garden discussion. And- Absolutely. There are definitely, like, in my in my personal life, I am very pro-open source. I think that if you buy it, you should be able to break it. Um, but when I am giving advice to other people who are not technical, who are not going to be taking advantage of this, uh, who will not be breaking it, um, and who are primarily concerned about uh, about their safety and security, sometimes I will recommend the walled garden. Yeah, it's it's... A, a means to an end, even if you uh, you you want to hack the device. Sometimes that's depending on your circumstances. It may not be the best place to be. And and that's just another example of meeting people where they are, and not where I think they should be. Not in you know doing what I do, but doing the thing that specifically works for them, and uh, instead of what I think they should be doing. So uh, covering cameras and microphones, useful, not useful. 
Well, uh, if your um, if your camera is compromised, then uh, covering it will definitely keep the person from seeing what it is that you are doing in in front of the camera. So, uh, yes, if that is the thing that you are concerned about, that is a, a legitimate way of dealing with it. Uh, covering microphones is a little bit trickier because uh, actually turning off the microphone is really hard. Um, and so the the chances that you will be able to uh, that covering the microphone will do much is much lower. Um, but there was a uh, there was a rash of cases of hackers targeting teenage girls and breaking in, uh, you know, compromising their webcams. Mm -hmm. I think this was back in like 2011, 2012, before everybody had a camera in their phone. Uh, but when people started getting, you know, sort of webcams and uh, and laptops, uh, and what they did was they would turn on the turn on the webcam without turning on the little light and uh, and spy on these girls. And they would do a couple of different things. I mean, first they would, you know, distribute the pictures. Um, but sometimes then they would just turn around and uh, send the pictures back to the girl and uh, and use that as blackmail, oh. uh, which is a particularly despicable thing to do. There's also a really popular uh, sort of sextortion scam going around where, uh, so you open your email and you get an email from a stranger saying, I have, uh, I have compromised your computer and I turned on your camera and I have seen you masturbating and I know what nasty porn you watch. And unless you want me to send this information to all of your friends and relatives, please send me Bitcoin. Uh, sometimes in order to show you that they are very serious, they will tell you your password is such and such. So, uh, this is a scam. This is a complete waste of time. Give them no money. They have not compromised jack shit. Uh, they often get, um, get your username and your password from an existing data leak. So you go to something like, have I been pwned? And you enter your email address and you check to see which accounts have, uh, have appeared in, uh, in password dumps. Uh, because that's what the attacker is doing. And then the other thing that the attacker is doing is essentially just working on your guilt. Yeah. And is combining those two things in order to you know, make a sort of sextortion scam. I, I have received that, that email and I was surprised at how old the password was. <laughs> I was like, wow, that must be from a really old data breach because I've been using a password manager for a long time and... That's pre-password manager days. Wow, that's that's old. Yeah, um, but I I get messages from people who have gotten these uh, these emails all the time, and from people who take them very seriously. Because if you don't know about this scam, this looks very legitimate and scary. And, and I've talked to a number of those people. And, and interesting, I've I've talked to the people who are they're really they're they're particularly confused. They they see the password and know that it's their password, and so they're freaked out because of that. But then they're, but my computer doesn't have a camera. How did they get a hidden camera into my house? And mind you, and then they're saying, well, but I don't even go to the sites like that. And so they're really confused as, and that password is that one piece of uh, air quotes proof that they've actually done what they've claimed to have done. And it's, it's been really hard to convince people that no, it's a scam. You you don't need to to figure out how to. You don't need to. Get, you don't need to figure out how to buy Bitcoin. You don't need to figure out how to send Bitcoin. Just delete the email. Yes, but it's it's actually one of the more satisfying things I do is people send me you know the panicked emails about the scam, and I tell them this is a scam. Ignore it. Delete it. Absolutely nothing will happen to you. I I wish more people would believe me when I tell them that. But that's the whole reason for the podcast. <laughs> okay, so what I want to be very sensitive and, and real about is that domestic violence is is very real. These stalker situations can can very much escalate uh, to violence uh, and abuse. Uh, for people in the U.S. who are looking for support, is there a particular place that they can go to? There are two organizations that I usually recommend. Uh, one is the NNEDV, the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Uh, and the other is uh, Operation Safe Escape. 
Um, if you're looking for more information about stalkerware, um, I recommend checking out the Coalition Against Stalkerware, which both NNEDV and uh, Operation Safe Escape are part of. Uh, and uh, we are at stopstalkerware.org. And we will make sure to link all of those in the show notes. And I think stopstalkerware.org has a resources page for um, resources outside the U.S. as well. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, we are also working with organizations in, uh, in Uganda, in India, organizations that are based in Europe. Uh, you know, this sort of stocking is not uh, is not limited to the United States by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. It's not even limited to what we popularly think of as, you know, the Western world, um, because it, it is becoming much more common for everyone to own a phone and for that phone to be a smartphone. And once everybody has a smartphone, then it becomes easier to track people using their smartphones. And I, I, I assume probably in... Uh, less economically, uh, in, in economically challenged countries, the likelihood of having the newest, uh, the newest phone with the latest firmware and the latest OS is probably a lot lower. And older phones, older firmwares, older OSs are going to be more likely to be easier to get this type of software on it and hide. Yeah. And let me see the and just so we have it in the show notes and for anyone listening, the U.S. National uh, Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-7233. And that's also available at the hotline dot org. If people want to be able to find you online, where can they find you and more well, about what uh -huh. you're doing? Uh, you can find out more about what EFF is up to by going to www.eff.org. Uh, you can find me by sending me an email to eva at eff.org. I have the world's shortest email address. Uh, and uh, if you are looking for my thoughts and uh, complaints about malware, uh, you can find me on Twitter where I am Eva Side, E V A C I D E. Great. Eva, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey podcast. If you know someone who thinks they might be stalked by an ex or current partner, please share this episode with them. It just might save their life. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Eva Galperin can be found at easyprey.com slash 68.